All right, I see that it is three o'clock. I think we're ready to begin. Are there any questions from last time? All right, so last time was uh, uh, more of a survey type lecture. Um, so this time uh, I wanna present some applications of, of the work we've been doing with groups and I wanna present some applications to uh, Van Oeymen algebras. Uh, to do that, I wanna do one more GNS type construction. Uh, so we've, we've done this before with positive type functions on sets uh, or also on groups. We're also completely positive maps on C-star algebras. And then I want to do one more with completely positive maps on von Neumann algebras. And uh, this is the following thing. So I'll focus on tracial von Neumann algebras. And so the theorem, uh, well, first we're going to need a little bit of a, uh, uh, hold on. Yeah, first I want to mention a lemma. Uh, let's call it a, a theorem because it's uh, it has a name. It's Cadison's inequality. And this is that if A is a C star algebra, uh, say a unital C star algebra. It's true in general, but we're only going to deal with UCP maps. Uh, if A is a, a unital C star algebra and phi mapping A to, um, if A and B are unital C star algebras and phi mapping A to B is unital completely positive. So then for all X and A, we have that phi of uh, X star, phi of X is less than or equal to phi of X star X. So these are both elements, they're both positive elements in B because B is a unital completely positive map and we always have this uh, inequality between them. So here's a proof of this. Uh, so the proof um, is just as follows. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Steinspring's theorem. So actually Cadison proved this before Steinspring's Stein Springs theorem. Um, so he didn't have that tool, uh, but we, we do have that tool. So let's go ahead and use that. So uh, by Stein Spring. There exists, so we might as well assume B is in some bounded operator. So we can assume, assume B is embedded inside of B of H because every C star algebra has a faithful representation. So we can assume that it's a subalgebra of B of H. And then we have a UCP map from A into B of H. And so we can use Steinspring's theorem. By Steinspring's theorem, there exists a V mapping H to K an isometry. Where K is another Hilbert space, and there exists a representation of A on bounded operators on K such that P of X is just equal to V star I of X V. So that was Steinspring's theorem. So we just have to check this for maps of this form. So let's go ahead and look at the difference of the right hand side. Uh, the right hand side up here minus the left hand side. And when we do that, we get that then phi of x star x minus phi of x star phi of x. This is equal to 
v star pi of x star x, v minus v star pi of x uh, star e, v star pi of x, v. And then we can factor this out. We can factor out on the left a v star pi of x star. And now we have 1 minus v v star. And on the right, we have a pi of x and then a v. And then uh, what do we see? We see here we are conjugating. And what are we conjugating? We're conjugating this 1 minus v. But v was an isometry, so v v star is a projection. So this is 1 minus a projection, which is a pro another projection. So this is a projection. Hence, greater than or equal to 0. And of course, conjugating a projection, you get that this is greater than or equal to 0. because conjugation preserves positivity. So that's uh, Cattison's inequality. Uh, in particular, we get that suppose if, um, suppose m tau is a tracial von Neumann algebra, and suppose we have phi mapping m to m, uh, UCP such that it's also going to be uh, trace preserving or we need just be subtracial, so sub such that the trace of tau composed phi of x star x is less than or equal to tau of x star x for all x and m. So this is what's called uh, i.e. V is subtracial. So then what do we get? Well, then we get that this norm of phi of uh, phi of x. So if we think of uh, x as sitting inside of L2, so we can take the L2 uh, squared of this, and we see what is this? We get that this is the trace of g of x star e of x, but now by Cattison's inequality, this is less than or equal to the trace of phi of x star x, and now by hypothesis, if phi is subtracial, then this is less than or equal to uh, trace of x star x, which is the norm 2 of x squared. So the reason that we're, we like subtracial UCP maps is because they give us a contraction on the L2 space. So we get that therefore phi defines a contraction which is usually denoted by T sub phi on the L2 space, the standard representation into itself. Uh, so this is given by T phi of x hat. Remember x hat was just m viewing inside of this genus representation. And this is phi of x hat. All right, so this defines a contraction on a dense subspace, hence extends to a contraction on, on the whole space. All right, so, uh, so this is why we like subtracial UCP maps. So now we can do one more GNS type construction. And that's the following. Uh, so suppose phi maps, uh, again, again here we have m tau, a tracial von Neumann algebra. Tracial von Neumann algebra. And when I say tracial von Neumann algebra, I always, the trace is always assumed to be normal uh, and faithful. So it's a normal faithful trace. This is the standing assumption. Uh, and suppose uh, E maps, although one remark I'll make, uh, this is one of the reasons why factors are so important. 
is that if M is a factor, then the trace is unique. And this is even, uh, even as a non-normal trace. Uh, for, factor, for, for finite factors, um, there's only one trace and it is normal. All right, but in general, you can have something like a, a, an abelian von Neumann algebra where every state is a trace. And so there we'll want to specify we always mean normal and faithful. Uh, suppose phi maps m to m, uh, ucp, and subtracial. So then there exists a Hilbert bimodule. Uh, H. So what does the Hilbert bimodule mean? It means that it's a module, meaning that we have a normal, and I should say normal, we have a normal representation on B of H, but it's also a right module, uh, so that just means we have a normal representation of the opposite out von Neumann algebra, and such that these two commute. So this is a Hilbert bimodule, i.e. we have uh, normal representations pi mapping in uh, to b of h and rho mapping m up to b of h such that uh, pi of x rho of x up is equal to rho of, uh, so y up, rho of y up, pi of x, and this is for all x and y. So you have these two normal uh, commuting representations. And usually we'll write, uh, we write pi of x rho of y up times c, we'll write this simply as x c y. Um, yes, so we can think of a left action of, of M op as the same as a right action of M. Uh, so go ahead, Julio. To have a Hiller by module, don't you need also like two inner products on H, that one that lands, I mean, that both land on, on M? Uh, no, 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 this is, uh, so if you've, if you've heard of a C star Hilbert module before, yeah. Then, then that's a generalization of a Hilbert space where the inner product takes values in the C star uh, and a C star algebra. Here I mean just an actual Hilbert bimodule. So this is just a Hilbert space with two normal commuting representations here. All right, but this is not, this was just the definition within the theorem. So uh, then there exists a Hilbert bimodule. So this is all within parentheses here. Uh, and a vector C naught and H such that, or maybe let me say C sub uh, phi because it depends on phi. So such that uh, for all X and Y and M, we have that the inner product of X C phi Y CP is equal to the trace of uh, what do I want here? Phi probably phi xy. Yeah, that looks right. Uh, so this is the theorem that if you have a nor uh, UCP subtracial map on a von Neumann algebra, then there's this corresponding Hilbert bimodule, uh, which satisfies this. And this is almost uh, actually a consequence of Steinspring's theorem. Uh, in fact, um, uh, this generalization, I, this generalization of uh, Steinspring's theorem that I that I mentioned, where you also got a normal representation of the commutant. Uh, can be used to prove this, uh, but we'll just prove it directly actually since the proof. So this, this was the theorem. 
so the proof is just another proof of like the GNS construction that we've seen before. Uh, so specifically, uh, we do a similar thing where we have a, uh, you know, we use the UCP map or the positive definite type function or something to define an inner product. And then, uh, and then we get a Hilbert space, et cetera, et cetera. So for here, the natural inner product, well, if you remember already from uh, Steinstring's theorem was M tensor uh, H, where H was the representation. But M here is a tracial von Neumann algebra, so it always embeds inside of L2, right? So L2 is standard. So in this case, we'll just define it on M tensor M. So on, on M tensor, so it's just algebraic tensor product M, we define a inner product by you know, a tensor b x tensor y. So p is going to be exactly here uh, the trace of uh, V of x star a, and I'm going to have a b, and maybe I'll put a y over there so it looks a little bit nicer, but it's a trace. You could put the y on the other side. All right, so this is, uh, this defines, and then you extend linearly. So this is a sesquilinear form. Uh, moreover, you check that for the same reason as the Steinspring's theorem, we have that phi completely positive implies that this is non-negative definite. This bilinear form is non-negative definite. Um, and then what do we have here? This is, um, we have the natural representation. And again, this is just the same as sign spring here. So we have the representation uh, pi. So the right regular, or the right representation x, and now we have here A tensor B and Y. Let me tell you the bimodule structure. And this is just going to be exactly X A tensor B Y. So this is the bimodule structure here. And then you can check that this extends linearly and it gives you a, um, and it gives you a, a, a bounded operator for X and Y, it's well defined. Uh, again, this is just a sketch of the proof. Since I don't want to go into so many of the details that are particularly interesting. Uh, so this defines a bimodule structure. Uh, and more, moreover, you have this map or uh, this vector C P, which is just one tensor one. Um, and this is a natural vector in there. And then you just look what is the inner product of X times C B times Y with itself. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly by our definition. So this is just X tensor Y, inner product one tensor one. And that's just exactly the trace of BXY. So that gives the formula. And then maybe the only non-trivial thing is to show that this is a normal representation uh, so meaning that if, you know, XI converges to zero in say the weak operator topology, and this is some bounded net. So this is a bounded net, uh, a bounded net. So then we need to show that uh, if we look at XI and then times some vector C, then it converges in the Hilbert space. And well, this is enough because we were allowed to consider bounded nets to check for normal representations. So therefore it's enough to check on a dense subspace. So we can just check this on things of the form A tensor B. And we need to compute the norm squared of this. And then you just compute uh, what this is. So this is going to be, here we're gonna have X, so this is the trace and here we're going to have a B star phi of A star X I star X I. And this is A. Oh, here we can do 
for checking normality, you can converge in the strong operator topology. Uh, and here we can do B. But now we see that this is, uh, we can use Cadison's, uh, uh, or what do I want to do here? So this is, uh, this is fine. This is because phi is normal. I want to claim that since phi is subtracial, it's automatically normal. Um, yeah, maybe I don't want to bother with that. So let me just go ahead and write that as an extra condition here. This, this is normal. Subtracial actually will imply normal, but I don't want to prove that. Uh, so I'll just add normal for the ECP map as a condition. And then what do we have? Well, now phi is normal. So this converges here to zero in the strong operator topology. So then the whole thing converges to zero because of the strong operator. So that shows that the left action is uh, normal, but you also have the same, almost the same computation you can compute with the right action. And now the only difference is that uh, the right action is even easier because then you're going to get the trace of now you're going to get x on the uh, with the b so you're going to get an x i star b star b j star a b uh, x i which is then certainly less than or equal to say the norm of b star b a star a b times tau x i star x i which goes to zero so you get that the left the right action is also a normal representation okay so this uh finishes this proof so whenever you have a normal ucp subtracial map you get this uh biomodule the converse is not quite correct because uh, you know, this vector has this extra property. So note that this vector C phi here has this property that if we look at X C phi Y uh, and take the norm squared of this, well, this is going to be tau of uh, phi of X star x uh, y y star and we see that this is certainly less than or equal to uh, phi of x star x times the norm 2 so this is squared times the norm 2 squared of y but it's also because you can use the trace this is a positive operator so this is some a star a and then you can uh, rearrange things and say that this is less than or equal to, and then something else, and then you, uh, this is less than or equal to the norm of y uh, squared, and now you get the trace of, well, a, a star, which is a star a, which is phi of x star x. I guess this is kind of proving that subtracial implies normal, is what all I'm doing here. Uh, and so this is then subtracial, so this is less than or equal to the norm of y squared times the norm of x2 squared. So this vector satisfies an extra special condition that's what's called a left and right bounded vector. That if we multiply it on the right by y, this is bounded by some constant uh, times, uh, times the norm two, or some constant times the norm two of y. And similarly, when we multiply it by x on the left, it's bounded by some constant times the norm two of x. So this, this is what's called a bounded uh, vector in, uh, in a Hilbert biomodule. And of course, not, not every bounded vector, or not every vector is a bounded vector. So this isn't quite a one-to-one -one correspondence between UCP maps and pointed Hilbert biomodules, but it's almost. You can go, you can go the other way if you want to modify this slide. All right, but I won't discuss that. All right, so what's the whole point of this? 
Uh, now I can give some applications of, say, property T, Hagger property to uh, von Neumann algebras. So there are three uh, kind of nice, really nice applications that you can prove uh, fairly directly. Uh, so first, let me give you some definitions. So here's the definition. And this was originally due to Kahn and Jones. And we'll say that uh, M tau has property T if whenever uh, phi n map n to m are say normal uh, UCP subtracial such that they converge pointwise in norm two to the identity. So such that Vn of x minus x and norm two goes to zero as n goes to infinity, and this is for all x and m. So then they converge uniformly in norm two on the uniball. So then the soup for all x in the uniball of m, so things with a uniform norm less than or equal to one, but the soup of the difference is in as in norm two. Now this also goes to zero as n goes to one. So this should remind you exactly of the condition for groups, which said if you had positive type functions which converge pointwise to one, then they converge uniformly to one. We also have, so that's property T, we also have the Hegra property. So M tau has the Hegra property. property, and this is if, uh, and remember for a Hegra property for groups, it was if there existed a, uh, a net or sequence of positive type functions which vanished at infinity, so C0 functions. So here uh, we have the Hegra property if there exists a, say, net, or if it's separable, you can take it to be sequence, uh, phi i, of normal UCP subtracial uh, maps such that, uh, well, they converge to the identity pointwise. This x norm two goes to zero, that goes to infinity, for all x and m, and uh, that they are compact, meaning that the corresponding operator is compact. So, and these corresponding operators, Ti, are compact operators on L2 of M. So that's the definition of the Hagger property. Uh, so there's actually uh, two maybe competing notions of compactness. I'll just mention this. Uh, so you can also, we, you can say that M tau has the compact, my daughter wants to join the lecture, has the compact approximation property, property. And this is if, again, the same thing, the same thing that we have up here, um, so the same thing here, except that and you have that uh, this, if you look at phi i of the uniball of M, you want that this is pre-compact in L2. So this is just a remark that, uh, you know, there are these competing notions, both seem to be natural general generalization of the Hagger property. So one clearly implies the other, the Hagger property clearly implies the compact approximation property because uh, these operators being compact means that the uniball in L2 is pre-compact in L2. So certainly that means the uniball and the uniform norm is pre-compact in L2. 
Um, but it's actually an open problem if these two notions are the same notion or not. So that's just the remark. It is known that for group von Neumann algebras, they are the same notion. In fact, uh, we can prove that right now. So here's the theorem. And that is that, uh, so if gamma is a group, so then uh, gamma has property T, T, or respectively the Hegra property. Uh, if and only if L gamma has the same prop, L gamma also does. So property T and the Hegra property are remembered by the group von Neumann algebra. All right, so let's go ahead and prove this. So we've we've almost uh, done everything, so the proof should be pretty quick. Uh, so what we have is we have this way of getting from positive type functions to UCP maps on the group, this the sure multiplication. Uh, but on the other hand, I also mentioned that we have this uh, map taking UCP maps on the von Neumann algebra to positive type functions on the group. And so we just have to check that these two maps are compatible with all these things we introduced. Uh, so, you know, if phi mapping gamma to the complex numbers is of positive type, so then we know that the multiplier m sub phi maps L gamma to L gamma is UCP. And what else do we know about this map, which takes positive type functions to UCP maps? Uh, we also know that, of course, this will also be tracial and trace preserving. Right, because what was the, uh, right, because remember the multiplier took things of this form, alpha t lambda t, and it just mapped it to some alpha t phi t lambda t. And the trace just picks up the identity element, which is phi of one, which is one, right? So the, this doesn't change the trace. Uh, so that's why this is you know, trace, trace preserving. In particular, it's subtracial. Uh, okay, so this is UCP and trace preserving. Uh, moreover, what can we compute is that if if say X is in L gamma, well then we can apply X to the unit. Uh, we know exactly what M phi looks like. Well, let me take it in a dense subspace. So if X is in C gamma, so then uh, what do we know? We know that uh, M phi of X, so say, let's give it an explicit description, say x is some sum alpha t lambda t. This is some finite sum. Then m phi of x minus x, what is this in norm two? So norm two squared, and this is exactly some t, and now we're gonna have alpha t, and we're gonna have a phi of t, that's what the multiplier does, minus one, lambda t norm two squared. And remember when we think of, so this is an element in the group algebra, group von Neumann algebra, but when we think of it as an element in the Hilbert space, that's just when we multiply it by the Dirac projected identity. So these lambda t's just change into delta t's. And so then we get a Hilbert space direct sum. So this is just equal to the sum over t of absolute value alpha t squared and then we get a phi of t minus one squared. So what do we know? We know that this sum of alpha t, this is just some finite sum. Uh, and so we see that as if 
we have a whole net of fees and they converge to the identity pointwise, then we see that m phi of x minus x goes to zero. And this is on a dense subspace. But we also know that these are subtracial. So in general, so this, in general, if x minus y and norm, norm two is say less than epsilon, so then m phi of x minus y, well, norm two squared say, well, this I already mentioned by Cadison's law, this is a contraction on norm two. So this is less than or equal to x minus y two squared. So this means that if we have a net of positive type functions such that they're multipliers, such that they converge to the identity pointwise, then on this dense subspace, the multipliers converge to the identity pointwise. But then since they're all contractions in norm two, that means on the whole space L gamma, they converge to identity pointwise. So we get that therefore, so if EI converges to one pointwise, so then M phi converges to the identity pointwise in one two. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the other thing that we need to check is that, uh, let's see. All right, so now let's maybe start the proof. So now let's suppose gamma has, or suppose um, gamma does not have T. If gamma does not have T, there exists such a sequence that doesn't converge uniformly. But then we, exi we exhibit this sequence, which doesn't converge uniformly, and hence L gamma does not have T. So if gamma does not have T, then there exists Phi such that phi i does not convert or converges to one pointwise, but not uniformly. And we get that therefore m phi i converges to the identity pointwise in norm two. That's what we just showed, but not uniformly in norm two on the uniball of L gamma because the group elements are contained in the uniball and it doesn't converge uniformly on the group elements. So we get that therefore L gamma does not have to. So now let's prove the other direction. So let's prove that if gamma does have T, then L gamma doesn't have T and we'll do this by contraposition. So if if L gamma, uh, actually we'll prove this by direct argument. So if, if gamma has T, so let's let the I mapping M to M be a net of UCP subtracial maps. Uh, so you see normal some traditional maps uh, such that the I converges to the identity pointwise in norm two. Well, well what can we do? We do this GNS construction. We got that there exists uh, Hilbert MM by modules. So normal Hilbert MM biomodules HI and vectors CI and HI such that trace of phi I XY is the inner product of X CI Y CI. So that was this GNS construction. 
But now we get this representation of the group. So we have to find a representation. So pi i from the group to the entire group on h i, we define. And this is by pi i t applied to some vector c is just uh, lambda t c lambda t star. We just conjugate by lambda t. And then what do we see? Well, the fact that, uh, so then the thing we see is that lambda t c i lambda t star uh, inner product with c i is exactly trace of phi i lambda t uh, lambda t star. And so if we subtract this from the norm of c i squared, well, that's just one, we get this minus one. Uh, so this is the trace of phi i lambda t minus lambda t lambda t star, which by Cauchy-Schwartz is less than or equal to the norm two of phi i lambda t minus lambda t, which we know goes to zero. And these are univectors, so note, uh, I already wrote it up there. These CIs are univectors. So what does that mean? That means here we have two univectors and they're, they're both univectors and their inner product is very, very close to one, but that means we've seen this before, that just means that those vectors are very close to each other. So we get a therefore lambda t CI lambda t star minus CI goes to zero. Uh, but now we see that here we have almost invariant vectors and gamma has property T. So we know that there's invariant vectors which are very close to these. So we get the therefore, uh, I guess all we need is just invariant vectors. There exists, uh, no, we need that they're close. Uh, so there exists eta i and h i such that lambda t eta i lambda t star is equal to eta i and we get that the distance between c i and eta i goes to zero. This is one of the characterizations of property t that not only do there exist invariant vectors but the invariant vectors are close together, uh, are close to the original vector. Um, so what does this mean? Well, uh, first notice that this condition, we can multiply on the right by lambda t. And so we get that lambda t eta i is actually equal to eta i lambda t, and this is for all t and gamma. But this formula is a little bit better because we can take spans of lambda t. And so we get therefore x eta i is equal to eta i x for all x in the group algebra. But the group algebra is dense in the von Neumann algebra and the weak topology. And these are normal represent, this is normal bimodule. So we then can pass to the closure. So we get the x eta i is equal to eta i x for all x in the von Neumann algebra. So these are central vectors, they call it. Uh, so these, these are central vectors and they're very close to our original vectors. Well, now what can we do? We can finally do the computation. What is phi of x minus x in norm two? Let's do the squared here. And we see that this is uh, exactly, uh, I guess I'll have to expand it out. So this is going to be phi of x norm two squared plus you're gonna have an x norm two squared, and then you're gonna have minus twice the real part of the trace of phi of x, x star. And now what do we see here? This is exactly, uh, this is 
less than or equal by Cadison's inequality we saw P is a contraction of norm two. So this is less than or equal to twice the norm two squared of X minus the real part of the trace of P of X, X star. But now a trace of phi of x, x star, that's exactly x um, ci x star. So by the GNS construction, this is twice. And here we have um, the inner product of ci minus x ci uh, x star. Uh, oh, not. Hold on. Uh, this is C i x x star minus C x C i x star inner product of C i. So that's the formula we have there. Uh, and now we can move the x star to the other side, and we can say that this is certainly less than or equal to the norm of, of x, so this is the uniform norm of x, uh, times twice, and now we have the norm of uh, ci x minus x ci. All right, so this is the inequality we have. So I apologize, I have to move on to the next page again. So I will have to erase some of this. Um, uh, so now the point is, is that because we have, there's my daughter again, uh, because we have this condition, now we can uh, change the ci by these eta i's and we only lose again something in the uniform norm of x. So again, by the triangle inequality, this is Whole thing. So this whole thing was p of x minus x norm two squared. So this is less than or equal to, and now I have twice the norm of x. Uh, so I'll just write out the last thing I had. So this is x ci minus ci x. But now we're going to re use it, replace ci with eta i. So here we can do the um, x eta i minus eta i x because that's equal to zero, so we'll just add that into this equation here. And then we'll use the triangle inequality again to say this is less than or equal to two uh, x, and now we're gonna get another uh, squared here, and then I guess since we're doing it twice, we'll get a four here, and then we're gonna get ci minus eta i, and this uh, goes to zero as i goes to infinity. And note that it only depends, uh, as long as we restrict to the unit ball, this is uniform on the unit ball. That's the key point. Uh, so this means that here we started with an arbitrary net of UCP subtracial uh, maps, and we concluded that they converged uniformly on the unit ball in norm two. So hence, L gamma has to. So that's the other direction. So that finishes the proof of the property T part. Uh, there's also the case of the Hagrup part, but the Hagrup uh, part you just have to observe that if phi is in C0 of the group gamma, so then what is T what is T sub M sub V? What is this? Well, you just compute this. So this times lambda T hat is exactly M V lambda T hat, which remember lambda T hat is just the Dirac function at T. And so this is then V of T times lambda T hat. So this means that this map T M V is actually a diagonal operator. So all of these lambda T's are eigenvectors. 
So it's a diagonal operator and the diagonal entries are exactly given by phi t. So we get that, uh, therefore, therefore t m sub phi is exactly just equal to the sum over t m gamma and we're gonna have phi t and then we're gonna have times the projection, the rank one projection onto um, the, this one dimensional subspace. So this is what the operator looks like. In particular, we see that this is compact if and only if uh, phi is C0. So this is in compact L2 gamma if and only if uh, phi is in C0. Uh, so this means right away that if gamma has the Hegar property, then there exists uh, these, this net here. And so we get that L gamma has the Hegar property. Uh, but also if L gamma has the Hegar property, then you can go back because remember I showed you that there was this functor that took uh, phi L gamma to L gamma if is UCP. So then we showed that this map uh, phi T defined by the trace of phi of lambda T lambda T star is positive type. And so we see if T phi is compact, then that exactly means that this map is also C0. And so this is how you get from L gamma having the Hegar property to gamma having the Hegar property. Right. So that's just an observation. All right, so that finishes the proof there. So I'll mention one quick corollary and then the other, uh, so this is the one corollary I wanted to mention and then there are two other results which I'll mention on Friday. So the first quick corollary is that in particular we get that say um, L of PSL2Z is not isomorphic. So L of PSL2Z is not isomorphic to L of PSL3Z. And that's just because on the left we have the Hagar property and on the right we have property T. Uh, but in fact, we get a much stronger statement. In fact, we get, in fact, L of PSL3Z is not isomorphic to any von Riemann subalgebra of L ESL 2 z So this is a corollary because uh, maybe I'll make this as a lemma at the beginning of next class, and that is that it, uh, the Hagar property passes to subalgebras. So if you, if you have a, a von Neumann algebra with the Hagar property, then any subalgebras also have the Hagar property. If it's a tracial von Neumann algebra. So we'll get this. The other remark I'll make is that in this proof here, uh, so we gave this if and only if proof here for property T. And like I said, this was, uh, so this, where'd it go? Uh, so for the property T part, this is a result of Kahn and Jones. Uh, from, I believe, maybe 85. And for the Hagra part, this is a result of Choda from, I think, 84, 83, somewhere around there. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so the remark I'll make is that for the property T part, so this was an if and only if statement, However, for to get that L gamma had property T, we didn't actually use that it was the left regular representation. Uh, indeed, all we used, if you look at what we used, we got this bimodule and we got these central vectors and then we needed that central vectors for gamma gave us central vectors for L gamma. So all this uses is that 
is that gamma generates the von Neumann algebra. So maybe I'll make that as an observation. So observe that if gamma has property T and we take pi mapping gamma to the unitary group of any von Neumann algebra, tracial von Neumann algebra. Um, so then the von Neumann algebra generates has T. So this is a representation. So the fact that it was the left regular representation didn't come into play at all for this direction of the proof. It was only for the converse. Uh, and this means you can show in fact that not only does, um, uh, yeah, you can use this to show that not only does L of PSL2Z not contain von Neumann algebras like PSL3Z, but in fact, even the unitary group can't even contain the unitary group uh, in a way that generates it. So this is a, um, an observation. Maybe, maybe I'll mention that a little more next time. All right, I think here's a good place to stop though. Are there any questions? Oh, uh, yes. Can I ask one question? Yes. Uh, I don't understand why eta i is in h i. Because uh, we are considering the uh, direct product of these h i. Right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm using here, this was one characterization of property t. I could go back in my notes. Uh, but this was gamma has t if and only if um, for every, uh, if and only if for every, for representations uh, pi and vectors, vectors ci and h, there existed eta i and h gamma such that Oh, it's almost invariant and almost invariant vectors. And almost invariant vectors. Uh, there exists eta i and h such that ci minus eta i go to zero. So this is the characterization I'm using. Yeah, and then the question is, how do I get a single representation? So in my setting, you can just take, uh, say, pi to be the direct sum of all these pi i's. And then of course, okay, you can say that eta i will be in uh, this direct sum, but you can then just take the projection down to the h i of whatever eta i. So this is, and then this gives you an eta i. And because- Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I understand, thank you. Yeah, so that maybe adds a bit more detail. All right, other questions? Uh, Professor, you mentioned that for the compact uh, approximation property for group von Neumann algebras, they are equivalent. Yeah, so that's just because, uh, so what you can do here, you have, uh, I mentioned already that, uh, so if this is this implies this, and, uh, and this, the same proof we gave for compact implies Hagerup, this also implies Hagerup for the same reason. Yeah, so, or sorry that uh, I said it wrong. So Hagerup clearly implies compact approximation property. And we showed that group having Hagerup implies Hagerup. And we also showed that Hagerup implies group Hagerup, but to show that uh, Hagerup implies a group Hagerup, here we just need the compact approximation property. So that completes the circle. But in general, it's an open problem if, if these are the same notion or not for a tracial domain.